Oftentimes our kids ask for things and they don't know really what they're asking for. So my youngest, Clayton, he is obsessed with animals. He loves animals and so he always wants some animal. He's asked for snakes and gerbils and hamsters and dogs. Like right now he really wants a pug and he wants to name the pug Doug the Pug because apparently there are books, Doug the Pug, and I'm like, you can't name a dog the same name that your dad has. That's just not going to work. But he's like, Dad, can I, can I get a pug? I'll take care of the pug. I promise I'll take care of the pug. And I'm like, listen, I know how this works. For like 38 seconds, you'll take care of the dog. And then I've got a dog that I have to take care of. And I don't want a responsibility that I have to take care of. But like, that's how your kids are. They ask for things. They like the idea of something. But they don't know really what they're asking for. One time, uh, Clayton's always gotten up early. So one morning, we were, I was up early. And he got up early. And he's like, Dad, can I have some coffee with you? I'm like, yeah, sure, that's fine. Give him a little bit of coffee, drank the coffee, threw up all over the kitchen. Shanna comes running in the room. What happened? He asked for coffee. I gave him some coffee. She's like, he's four years old. What do you mean you, he asked and you gave it to him. She's cleaning it up. Like she threw all the coffee away. I wasn't allowed to drink coffee for a month. I was in the doghouse and I was in punishment. I was like, time out. And that's why we can't get a dog named Doug the Pug because when everybody's yelling at Doug, I'll have PTSD because I get, you know, in trouble a lot. And so she's like, why would you give him call? I don't care if he asked for it. Why did you give him call? I was like, I didn't think, I just thought he would sip it and go, that's gross and not want it anymore. I didn't think like, all that was going to happen. Because sometimes your kids ask for something. They think they know what they're asking for, but they really don't know what they're getting themselves into. Now, as we continue our series in Galatians today, what the Apostle Paul is going to do is he's going to show us that the Galatians are asking for something, but they don't know what they're asking for. They don't really understand what they're getting themselves into. And not only is it a problem that they have, but it's a problem that we have oftentimes as well. And so we're going to be in Galatians chapter 4. We're going to be unpacking verses 21 to 31. So if you've got a Bible, I encourage you to turn it there. And in our passage today, um, the Apostle Paul is going to unpack a very familiar Jewish story that takes place in the book of Exodus that we need to kind of get our minds wrapped around before we talk about the passage itself. It's with uh, Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, and the story includes Sarah as well as Hagar. So what happens in Genesis 12, we've talked about this before, God goes to Abraham and says, I'm going to make you into a great nation and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And your offspring will be as numerous as the sand on the seashore and as numerous as the stars in the sky. So Abraham, you're, just, you're going to have just a massive family. A great nation of people are going to come from you. The problem is that Abraham, when he hears that, he's 75 years old, his wife is 65, and they have no kids. So they're like, you know, Abraham, it said Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham is like waiting and expecting this child to come about in a supernatural way because of the promise that God gave. But after 10 years, they start to get a little impatient. And Sarah, his wife, is like, listen, we haven't had kids and you're going to be a great nation and all this stuff, but like, when is this going to happen? How is it going to happen? We need to help God out a little bit. So here, here's my maidservant, Hagar. She's an Egyptian. You should have kids through her. And Abraham's like, okay. So they have Ishmael. Now Ishmael is born... Ten years after the promise, but was not the child of the promise. And because Hagar was able to, able to give Abraham a male offspring and Sarah couldn't, Hagar, the maidservant, held it over her boss, essentially. And she made fun of her and she used it and now there's all this tension as a result. So there's tension between Sarah and Hagar and as a result there's tension between Abraham and Sarah. And Sarah's like, how could you do this to me? And why didn't you think this through? And he's like, but you told me to do it. And so if you've, ever, if you've ever done something your spouse told you to do and they got mad at you for it, you have a biblical marriage by definition because that's what Abraham and Sarah kind of go through. And Abraham essentially is like, hey, do whatever you want with her. You want to send her away? Send her away. God's already said this isn't going to be the child of the promise that he's going to supernaturally bless us with a kid. So do whatever you want with Hagar and Ishmael. And they're, so they're sent away. And the bottom line is, what Paul's going to point out is, hey, listen, 
if it was that easy, if it was just, well, here, let's just give Abraham a different wife, and he can have kids through her. That's a natural thing. There's nothing supernatural. There's no God's blessing as a part of that. When God said, I'm going to make you into a great nation, God said, I'm going to give you offspring, God's saying, I'm going to do it in a supernatural way. I'm going to do it in such a way that when it happens, everybody goes, how else does that happen but God? So the promise is given when Abraham's 75, and Isaac is born when he's 100. Because then it's like, okay, how else do we explain this other than God working in a miraculous and mysterious way? So in our lives, people try to do things to earn God's favor, to earn his love, to earn salvation. That's a very common thing. That's a natural thing because it's us doing a bunch of stuff. And when Abraham tried to do things outside of the plan of God, you get Ishmael. But what God wants from us is not a natural birth, but a supernatural birth, a relationship with him that does not depend on our efforts and what we're able to do, but that completely depends on him. So you have two different scenarios, one that's based in the law and one that's based in grace. And Paul is saying to the churches in Galatia, you, you say you want the law stuff, but you don't know what you're asking for. Now, as we have been walking through the book of Galatians, and we've talked about the relationship between law and grace, and how important it is to lean into grace for our salvation, but also how important it is to try to live for God, I came across a chart by a pastor and author by the name of Tim Keller, and he kind of breaks this down um, in, in a way that's like, oh, that's clear, that's concise, and I can use this to kind of evaluate my life to see kind of where I'm at and what camp I reside in. And what he points out is there are four main types of people, both inside the church and outside the church as well. And here's kind of the chart of those four groups of people. You have law-obeying, law-relying people, law-disobeying, law-relying, law-obeying, not law-relying, and law-disobeying, not law-relying. How confused are you at this moment? You're like, I have no idea how this is all supposed to make sense. Let's unpack it real quick. Group number one, the law-obeying, law-relying people. These are the people who try to keep all the rules, and they are relying on their rule-keeping to give them a relationship with God. So in the Old Testament, this is kind of how you see the Jews operating. When Jesus is on earth, this is the Pharisees, this is the Sadducees, the teachers of the law. They've got a list of rules that they're going to keep, and to them, that defines their relationship with God. So does God love them? Yeah, look at how many rules I keep. Look at all the boxes I check off. And if this is your camp, if you're keeping all of the rules and you're relying on your status before God like with all the rules, what it's going to produce is pride and ego and arrogance. And we can see in Scripture that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So if you have something that you're doing that's producing more pride and ego and you feel really good about yourself because you're so much better than everybody else, that takes you away from God. Group number two, <clears throat> people who disobey the law, but also rely on it. They're like, well, who would do that? Most people fit in that category. So during Jesus' time on earth, the sinners and the tax collectors, the Zacchaeuses of the world, they also believed you need to do a bunch of stuff to have a relationship with God. And we're just not good enough to do any of it. And so they didn't have pride and ego. They had shame and embarrassment. They didn't feel like they had a relationship with God because they weren't good enough. Even in our world today, do you have friends who, when you invite to church or if you invited to church, they'd be like, oh, I can't go to your church. I'm not a church person and church people. I, I, I'm not good enough to go to your church. If I went to your church, God would like, you know, knock the walls in or he'd strike the church with lightning. I'm not a church guy. I'm not good enough to go to church. Do they think that way? You know why? Because they fit in camp number two. They don't keep any of the rules of the Bible, and they feel like because of that, God can't love them, God won't love them, and they're separated from God. And so they feel this way because this is a very common mindset that people have. Hey, there are a bunch of rules. This is how you're supposed to live, to be a church person. I'm not doing it. Therefore, God doesn't want anything to do with me. And they misrepresent who God is and who Jesus is because of this. I'll skip three because that's the correct one. Number four. People who disobey the law and people who don't rely on the law. So, you know, you think of like uh, what I would call like a hippie Christian who says, listen, it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter how you live, 
God just loves you anyway, which is true. He does. He just loves you. But after you become a Christian, there is an expectation that you're going to change your life to follow Jesus. Why? So you can be saved? You're already saved. Already saved. But there's a better way to live. Jesus came to die to pay the penalty for your sins, not so you could continue to sin, but because you could recognize there's a better way to live. And so the person who's like, I just want my ticket to heaven punched. I've got it. Now I'm going to live however I want to live. And James 2 talks about how faith, without effort, without works, without an attempt to follow God, isn't really true faith. It's dead faith. So camp number four, they are apathetic to the commands of God, to bringing him glory, to try to bring other people into a relationship with him. They're not concerned with that acronym that we have, growth, the six practices of a growing Christian. They're not going to give generously, run in a tribe. They're not going to open doors, win souls, tackle sin, or hunger for God. They're not going to do that stuff. Why? Because they don't have to. But they also don't have any desire to even want to. The healthiest view of what we see in Scripture and the commands in the New Testament and how it pertains to our salvation is camp number three. That you do your best to obey what you see in Scripture. You do your best to talk to people the way God wants you to talk to people and to think the way God wants you to think and act the way God wants you to act. Do you rely on what you do to determine your relationship with God? No. Your relationship with God is determined by Jesus. And your salvation is by grace through faith. But as Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, we are saved by by grace through faith for good works. So we are supposed to live differently from our past life to our new life, from being lost to becoming found. Not so we can get anything from God. We've already been given everything from God but so that we can live the way God wants us to live because we recognize we have this love and this grace already. And so as we, before we move on from there, like you have to determine which camp you find yourself in because it will determine your relationship with God and what you think God thinks about when God thinks about you, but it will also determine how people in your life who have a connection with you, how they think about God based on how you live and how you think about God. Non-Christians aren't going to go to the Bible. They're not going to YouTube sermons to try to figure out who God is and what God thinks of them. Do you know how, where they pick up who God is and what he, think he picks up from us? They pick it up from us. They learn about who God is by the way that we think about and talk about God. So we've got to be careful. We're in the right camp for our sake and for the sake of the people that are in our lives that are far from God as well. And I would imagine that in our room today, and you throw in those who are watching online as well, that we've got some of each camp. And I would also imagine that at different seasons and points of your life, you move from camp to camp. And so this is a reminder today. Do what Scripture says. Not so that God will love you, but because God already loves you. And if you don't hear anything else today... Take heart of that. And if you're tired, just go ahead and take a nap for the rest of the sermon. Because that's the big stuff I want you to leave with today. Okay? But, because you're good Christian folk, I know you're not going to take a nap. We're going to walk through Ephesians chapter 4, beginning verse 21. Here we go. Tell me, Paul says, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? This is Paul's way of saying, do you really know what you're asking for here? Three-year-old wants a puppy. I know how to take care of a puppy. I'll take care of the puppy. Do you really? So Paul's like, okay, you guys want to be judged according to the principles of the law. That's how you want God to see you, through how good you do these things. Do you really know what you're asking for here? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, But his son by the free woman was born as the result of the divine promise. So here he differentiates two different sons, two different ways of thinking in terms of our relationship with God. One is the story of Hagar and Ishmael. That is human beings trying to do whatever it is they can to have a relationship with God and grow in a relationship with God. This is what religions are. Every single culture 
in the history of the world has a religious structure where people try to do different things to earn God's love, earn God's favor. Religions are people searching for God, trying to make God happy, trying to earn God's love. That's what religions are. But that's not what Christianity is. Christianity is a relationship with God through the blood of Jesus. It is not us doing things for God. It is God doing something for us. It is God searching for man. It is God redeeming man. It is God loving mankind, even in spite of who man is and what man has done. So religions, God, look at us. We're sacrificing our kids. Like culture, Every culture has done that, murdered their kids to appease the gods. It's like, look at what we've done. Look at what we've done. Christianity is Jesus comes and he's the sacrifice. And it's like, look at what Jesus did. Now we can have a relationship with God, not based on us, but based on him. So Paul's like, you got two options. You can live according to your effort, according to the law, whatever rules you want to throw in. If you do these things, okay, you can have that. But now you're under slavery. He's talked about this previously in Galatians as well. Or you can be a child that's born supernaturally and experiences a different type of relationship with God. Hagar and Ishmael was born naturally. Isaac was supernatural. When we give our life to Christ, we are a new creation. It is a supernatural birth that takes place. Paul's like, this isn't even a difficult option here. But you have these two sons. And these two can be taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. And this is Hagar. Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. Mount Sinai, this is where the Ten Commandments are given. This is where they consider like the law is given. It's like, well, the law is good. It is, because it shows us how we're supposed to live. But the law was never meant to save. So if you try to live according to the law and be saved according to the law, you're in bondage, you're in slavery, you will never experience the fullness of God. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. So the Jerusalem on earth is slavery. It's bondage. The Jerusalem that's in heaven, where Jesus is, is one of grace and supernatural blessing and experiencing God in a way that, you know, we've never been able to experience a God according to the principles and the tenets of the Old Testament. Verse 27, Paul says, For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Basically saying there are more people who follow the law and try to earn their salvation than those who were born in a supernatural way. Because there are more people who follow the basic tenets of the idea of religion and trying to do things to please God and trying to earn our salvation and trying to earn our relationship with Him. More people live like that than experience this, this supernatural spiritual birth. Because this makes sense to more people. It makes more sense that, like, okay, I, I should probably do some things so that God will love me. I should probably do some things to try to please God so that I can be saved. As opposed to, it's all Him, and it's all been done. As I mentioned, Christianity is the only religion, the only way of thinking of God in those terms. Every other religion thinks the opposite way. You've got to earn it. And most religions believe that when you're on your deathbed, you don't know if you've done enough to make God happy or to make the gods happy. There's ambiguity. There's still fear. There's still uncertainty. But not for those who have Jesus. You don't have to wonder, did I do enough? Because Jesus paid it all. And so when you think about those two comparisons, it's like, well, I want to be safe. So let me just do a bunch of stuff just in case. Now you're trying to earn it. You're either one camp or the other. You can't have, you know, a foot in both camps. Verse 28, he says, Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of the promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born of the power of the Spirit, and it is the same now. He's referencing back that when Isaac, um, you know, he was being weaned and they were having a party to celebrate it, Ishmael made fun of him, Ishmael persecuted him, and that's when Ishmael and Hagar were sent away. He's like, so there's been tension among those born under the law and those 
born according to the promise. There's been this tension since the very beginning, and it continues to this day. Those who live according to the law are always persecuting those who live according to the Spirit and according to grace. Read the book of Acts. You see the way the Jews persecuted the Christians. And even after, even after the book of Acts, you have the Romans persecuting the Christians because they don't understand the ways that we live. And it's so much different than the way that they live. Now, it's kind of complicated to think of. But what you have is God's promise and Abraham's relationship with Sarah being first and primary. Then he's given Hagar. But then in terms of when the sons are born, Ishmael is born first. Then Isaac is born. So what happens on a practical level, Abraham gets a promise. He believes God has credited him as righteousness. It's established that the people of God will live by grace through faith. But then the actual promise of Jesus coming happens hundreds of years after the law is given. So generation after generation after generation, the Jews lived according to a bunch of rules. And they kept adding to the rules. So it's like rule or rule or rule. And they would take the rules and they would like dissect them. It's like, okay, well, this rule can be broken down into 17 and a half parts. This is how we know we're following the rules. So it's just they were just consumed with the rules for hundreds of years. So when Jesus came, they had a hard time making that shift and pivot. From the very beginning, it was about grace through faith. The law came to show how much we need that grace. The law came to show how holy God is and how sinful we are, how much we need a Savior. But they were so consumed and stuck in the traditions and the tenets of the law that they were unable to just like let go of all of that and just receive grace and God's love. So just like Sarah and the promise were given first before Hagar, Ishmael came before Isaac. The law comes before Jesus. And this is why they're having such a hard time pivoting. But I would say it's not just, it's not just them. Sometimes it's us as well. Based on our traditions, based on our church background, based on our upbringing. He goes on to say in verse 30, But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman woman. We don't live by the law, we live by grace. Now as I mentioned, th- this, is, this is tricky because sometimes we are following the law and relying on the law without even connecting the dots and realizing it. Here's how I want to end today. I want to compare what a life in the law and what a life in grace looks like. Because it might have the same activities but the why And the reasons behind what you do, they are on opposite ends of the spectrum. And so, let's compare the grace and law. The law, it's like, this is something that I have to do. But with grace, this is something I get to do. So, on our growth acronym, the H is hunger for God. That's about reading your Bible and fasting and praying and doing all this stuff. Do you get up? And when you pray, it's like, this is what I have to do because this is what a Christian is supposed to do. And I'm going to read my Bible, not because I want to learn about God, not because I want to grow in my relationship with Him. I'm going to read my Bible because that's what Christians are supposed to do. Does it move? Is it like obligation or is it opportunity? A person who's living under the law is going to do things because, like, this is what we're supposed to do. I don't want God to be mad at me. I want to do things so that God will love me. So here I go and read my Bible. God, look, I'm a good Christian. Read my Bible. But a person who's living under grace. They're still going to get up, make their Folgers coffee, pour it in a cup, get God's word. Look, Maxwell House, anything's fine. I, I'm not plugging Folgers. I don't get any advertising money from them, all right? But you got your coffee there and you're reading your Bible. Why? Because God loves you. And you know that how we follow him, how we serve him is in Scripture. What better way to live than according to the principles of his word? Like, in, in, in a selfish way, I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good father. Guess where that's at? Scripture. So if I learn more about the Bible, I learn more about who God is, I learn more about how God wants me to live, I become better in every single area of my life. It's something I get to do. It's an opportunity that God has given each and every one of us that we might live the way he wants us to live and be told what that even looks like. That's a big difference between the law 
and grace. The law is obligation. Grace sees opportunity. The law also is all about control, whereas grace is all about influence. So you think about different churches, different denominations, and depending on where you grew up going to church, a lot of churches are really big on control. They're going to tell you what to do. They're going to tell you when to do it. They're going to tell you how to do it. You can't read these books. You have to fast during this time of year. And this is what you're going to, we're going to do. This. You know, it's like, it's do this, do this, don't do this. And they're going to tell you everything. Here's the list of rules. You better keep them. It's like, this is all about control. Grace is all about influence. Recognizing there is a way to live. We're not going to control you. God's given you free will. God doesn't try to control you. Why are we going to try to control you if God doesn't try to? And so there is a way to live. And we're going to, like, there needs to be accountability. If I'm acting like a a knucklehead, I want someone to say, hey, you're acting like a knucklehead. You need to, like, clean this up a little bit. Not because they want to control me, but because they don't want to see me ruin the relationships in my life or take people away from God. And you think about your relationship with your kids. In many ways, when they're young, it starts like you, you kind of control them a little bit because they're small and they're easy, that you can pick them up and move them places. So like, you know, little Billy can't throw a fit in the supermarket because he didn't get the candy he wanted. And when he does, you can pick him up and carry him out of the store. You can control them in that way. But when they're like 16, 17, 18 years old, you ain't picking them up and moving them anywhere. That would be a funny TikTok video, I'll give you that, but probably not sound parenting execution, right? Like at, at, at a certain point, as a parent, you move from like disciplining to coaching. You move from having control over your kids to just trying to influence your kids. Well, where do you get that influence from? A place of love and a place of grace. Your kids are more willing to listen to you if they think... You love them and want what's best for them. And you're not trying to control them because you really can't control them. That's a big difference too. I'm tangenting now, but like when you teach younger kids versus older kids, like if you're in a classroom, you got the older kids, you, can tr- you think you can control them, you're not going to be able to control them because they got their own brains and they're insane. They got hormones rolling through their body. It's like, I don't like the younger kids. Yes, because you can't control them. You got to influence them. It's a different way to execute, you know, discipline in the classroom well in our relationship with god he doesn't try to control us that's why he's given us free will he still wants us to do the right thing he still wants us to live how he wants us to live but through his love and grace we're influenced to choose that as opposed to picked up and sat down and told what needs to happen with the law it just tells you what you can't do or tells you what to do grace helps with what you can't do So in terms of the law, it's a list. Do's, don'ts, good luck. Grace is, here's how I want you to live, and I'm going to strengthen you to live the way I've called you to live. So when I was a kid, I I high jumped when I was in junior high. Even though, like my freshman year, I was 5'3", 106 pounds. Like I was tiny. So they have the bar set up, and like at a certain point, it's like, you know, the bar's up here. I'm not getting that. Like I'm out. And like, it, like you, get, you start to run out there, you're like, I, I'm not even going to try. I just, I just jump underneath the bar. I'm out. I quit. I give up. It was easier than like going to the guy. It's like, I'm out, I'm out. This is what the law is. It's like, here you go. Jump over that. And you're like, I can't jump over that. Okay, well, you're not good. It's really terrible to be you. You're out. Grace is, yeah, the bar's here, but here's a trampoline to jump on. Or here's a stepladder. Now you can get over the bar. So there, there is a standard of living. There's a way to do things. There is right and wrong. But God's going to help you get to where he is calling you to be. The law beats you up. Grace builds you up. So the law is, look, you did all these things. That's great. But what about the one thing you did wrong? So you got all of these right. You got 99 things. Yep, good. But the one thing, here it is. And some of you grew up in a house like that, more law-based. The emphasis was on the negative. It never was on the positive. And you walk out of conversations, you can have a boss like that, you can have a teacher like that, you can have a a spouse like that, you can have a parent like that. Every time you walk away from a conversation, you don't feel built up, you don't feel encouraged, you don't feel straight, you feel torn down. 
you feel this tall. There's a problem. And the problem is, there is a standard. And they don't care if you can meet it or not. They don't care what's realistic. It's like, no, this is the standard. And every time you fall short, we're going to make sure you know about it. It just tears you down. You're not motivated to change your life. You're not motivated to live better. You just feel beat. I'll never be good enough. Grace, hey, you're, you're still driving the ball. You're still making mistakes. But let's build you up. Let's encourage you. Let's love you well so that you are motivated to live how God wants you to live. The law tears down, beats you up, grace builds you up. The law, and when you live according to the law, love is at the finish line. You've got to work and you've got to do, and at the end of your life, hopefully I did enough, hopefully I earned it, hopefully God looks at me with love, but you know my fingers are crossed because I don't know for sure. With grace, love is at the starting line. And so whenever you get baptized, it's like, okay, I'm identifying with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection because his grace is what saves me from my sins. I don't need to wonder what God thinks about me. I know he loves me unconditionally because I can look at the cross and the empty tomb to determine that for me. So love, straight out of the gate, you're giving it. To the max, it's unconditional, it's there. And from there, you do your best to grow in your relationship with Jesus. But you can see there are two completely different ways of thinking and living in your relationship with God. Which camp do you find yourself in? Like when you think about God, do you resonate more with the law side? Like, no, I, yeah, I do think there's, there's a lot that I have to do. I do think it's about control. I do, th- I do feel beat up sometimes as I think about God and what God expects of me, and I don't feel like I have love. I feel like I have to earn it. That's a problem for you and for the people in your life who are far from God, who need to know what living for God looks like. Once again, they're going to learn that from us. And if you're on the law side of things, people are going to understand God by how you live, by how you think, by how you talk, by how you experience church and talk about church and the different things that that you recognize are important for Christians to do and obey. And you don't do it with a smile on your face. You don't do it with excitement. It's not something you get to do. It's like, I got a loved one today. Oh, man, this is inconvenient because this guy's being a jerk. I really want to tell him off. Like if, you, if, it, if it's your mindset, if it's negative, if it's a bird, if it's like, I have to do this, I hate this, people are going to pick up on that. And people outside the Christian faith... They don't want to be told what they have to do. They don't want someone trying to control their lives. They don't want to be beat up. They don't want to try to earn anything. That's going to push them further away from God if they think that's what Christianity is. And I would, I would imagine if you were to pull the non-Christians in your life, they would think more in terms of law than grace. That's why they've not entered a relationship with Jesus. Well, you know whose job that is to get that right for them? God's not been miscommunicating things. God's not dropped the ball. God's not messed up his messaging. Like the angels, it's like, hey, wait a minute. Who's, now, why, why do people think this way? Angels come in here. Well, I guess we kind of got some false advertising, some disinformation out there, and people think it's about law and not about grace. And it ain't their fault. I guess whose fault it is if people think that way. It's ours. Now, the enemy exists and is trying to get people to think on the left side of the screen as opposed to the right. That's so true. But we don't help our own cause. And we don't help in building God's kingdom if we make it about law and not about grace. Here's my challenge to you. First, evaluate which group that you're in. Are you a law person? Do you rely on the law or do you rely on grace? You can't rely on the law. Never. It it doesn't build you up. It's not going to give you life. You're going to feel beat up. You're going to get further away from God. Either you're going to do a bunch of stuff really good and have pride and ego, which takes you away, or you're going to do stuff really bad, which is going to bring you guilt and shame and take you away. But if you're on the law-abiding side, it ain't going to end well. On the grace side, make sure that it's like, I'm saved by God's grace. I'm so thankful for that. And because of that, I am going to clean up my life. I've experienced something wonderful, and I want as many people in my life to experience it as well. So I'm going to change the way that I live 
so that I can be a godly example, so that I can bring more people into a relationship with him. I'm going to change the way that I live. But that, that love and that strength, it comes to me at the start line. So if I mess up, if I fall short, if I drop the ball, if I don't measure up, God's love doesn't go down. It's there. It's at the max all the time. And I just want to do my best to follow him, to enjoy a deeper relationship with him. And I want other people to come into that relationship as well. So be thinking about that. Be processing. Be praying. Where do you fit? What needs to change in your mindset? And what may need to change in your actions as well? That's what I want you to be thinking and praying about this week. Father, we're thankful that you give us the opportunity to follow you, to serve you, to love you, that you strengthen us, that you equip us to live according to your perfect will, and according to the principles that are found in your word. Father, I pray that you convict our hearts. I pray that you challenge us. I pray that we feel motivated to serve you, follow you, love you well. We lift all this up. We pray a blessing on it in Jesus' name. Everybody says?